Hello and welcome to today's pattern. I'm delving into the world of dry flies with one of the best kept secrets from the competition scene and the caddis imitation. Have you been thinking about time flies but don't know where to start? We've got a free series of video tutorials that might interest you. A lot of YouTube videos jump straight in with the tying and there's really no time for a beginner to get a handle on what's going on. So we've created a series of individual step-by-step -step videos that cover the basics of fly tying. In each video you'll learn a different skill at your own pace. So for instance, we'll teach you how to tie on a thread on the hook. We'll teach you how to tie in materials on the hook. We'll teach you how to dub materials onto the thread and we'll cover several ways of whip finishing to finish the fly at the end of the tying. Once you've got a handle on these basics, you'll be able to follow along with YouTube fly tying videos like the one you're about to see. If this sounds like something that might interest you, click the link in the description and you can start your free fly tying tutorials today. Depending on the size of the caddis on your own stream, you can basically just change the hook size to suit uh, as necessary because the blueprint for this pattern, it just applies across all those different size ranges. For the purposes of demonstration, I've got a, a standard size 10 um, dry fly. It's actually a wet and dry fly, particularly this, this particular pattern um, in the vise. Uh, it's a good strong hook and it suits this kind of utility, almost like the, you know, the marines of the, the dry fly world. Um, it's a go anywhere pattern. It kind of works almost as well partially sunk as it does on the surface. Um, so let's get stuck into the tying now. I'm using a, a very neutral coloured thread. It's the white uh, GSP uh, Fish On Ultimate Tying Silk. And because of that GSP material, I'm going to put on a decent bed of thread so it doesn't slip off unexpectedly. It's super, super strong. You could pretty much cut your fingers if you try and break it um, by pulling it. Now then this pattern I believe originally used a kind of a yarn to make a, a sort of a detached body and I've played around with it and have um, had some fun and basically using the materials that I've got to hand to create the same sort of profile and settled on a quite a good recipe um, at least in my experience. I found that you can when you uh, look at these uh, synthetic dubbing materials with a fairly long staple. That's quite important. It needs quite a long fibre. Uh, but you can quite easily create these noodles that are quite robust. Um, and you can have quite a good degree of control over the shape of that as well. So you can taper it at both ends quite easily. And that suits that kind of bulbous, caddisy uh, abdomen profile in my experience. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay on multiple twists through that wad of dubbing. Try and spread the twists fairly evenly throughout the length of it. And then if I hook that over the eye of the hook that I've got in the vise there and then just cause it to start to fail together at that point with a little bit of encouragement what you'll find is it actually forms quite a nice furled body and it is you know quite maggot looking <laughs> if we're going to be absolutely honest but that then it's like a hairy insecty grubby you know ribbed very, you know, you're getting a lot of cues for the sort of the prey item, the prey image that you're trying to imitate here. But just keeping that twist in place by pinching fairly hard, I can have a look against the shank, the sort of length that I want that body to be. And then when I cover it with this hand, I know how much of that body in the abdomen is left inside that pinch grip. And then that lets me do a simple pinch and loop onto the top of the shank of that body. And that's probably about roughly the midpoint of the hook shank itself. I'm going to put a good few turns on there and I'm cinching down with some tension in between each one. As I'm doing that I'm supporting the hook in my pinch grip so I'm not fatiguing the wire of that hook material. 
and I'm going to come in front of that body, lash on some turns there, so that's a good connection between the, the turns that are going around the shank and the body and the turns that are just on the shank and that helps again to sort of make a really good strong anchor point for that material. That furl is now consolidated because I've tied it in and clamped it in place with the, the thread turns. I can come off really super short, trim very tightly up to those thread wraps and then I'll just cover some of those stubby cut ends just to taper that in a little bit but it doesn't matter too much because you can cover a multitude of sins with the next step. Um, and although I'm sort of walking you through this fairly slowly and in actual fact the, these flies are actually pretty quick to tie. So I'm going to come to my trusty grey squirrel pelt and fret out a few fibres, trying to get some a mixture of under fur and the, the guard furs as well. And you don't need loads of it, but a little pinch like that is ideal for our purposes. Plus you can always put a bit more on um, if, you, if you need to. But this is, this is a great imitation for the chaotic, leggy profile of caddis that, that find themselves on the surface. Um, and it's a pretty good imitation for the, the farate adult, the pupa as well. And just come forward and try and get, you know, lots of nice spiky legginess going on with that. And then I'm just going to encourage any of those guard fibres that I can just to poke backwards. Come in front of that. And just build a little bit of a thread down in front of it. Any that are not attached, they can you know, just fret out anyway. Next thing to come in is a CDC wing, and you, you can vary the number of plumes that you use depending on the size of hook that you've got and what you need to float. Um, on that point, um, whenever I'm using CDC, I'm very, very keen. It's almost essential to have you know, the right kind of floatant that'll work with your drive fly. This is actually, it's a desiccant that drives out the water. Uh, so when you've had a fish on it and you've rinsed off the fish slime, it'll immediately bring it back to life. Um, very, very useful, very effective. And it's one of these fume silica products, but not all fume sil silica is equal. So choose one that definitely works. And I've got a lot of faith in, in that particular product. Interesting, this one, I quite like the profile of leaving the ends uncut. And there's actually a lot, I mean, there's very, very famous F fly. Um, but Marianne Fratnik, actually, a lot of people, they, they don't like the, the square cut end and they like this sort of um, shape. And, and I'm certainly, you know, I, I like that from an imitation point of view. Marianne Flat, Fratnik in the original F fly, he deliberately cut those um, squared them off because he felt that the very stiffness of that fiber was important for it to be able to shed the water afterwards. And I, I'm also a strong believer in that there's relatively limited impact of the actual natural oil. So this idea of oils leaking out of those feather fibers isn't as important as the complex barb structures that, that trap the air bubbles and that actually creates the, the floatability. And that's why it's important to use the right kind of floatants that help drive out that moisture and maintain that feather structure that, that traps the air. Um, the good thing about the that dust floatant as well and the desiccant is that you can reduce the amount of it as well to make the fly sit lower or you can re-treat it and get it to sit higher as well. number of occasions where I've cast a fish where it's been freshly treated and I've had a fish come and look at it but then refuse if I've just squeezed out some of the air and just removed some of the excess powder and sat that fly down a bit further into the film, taking the, fly, the fish on the next cast. So it's great to be able to have that control over your presentation based on how you treat those flies. All that being said, the trick now is to you match the tips up and I've, I think I've got four plumes in here. So I've got two with the convex uh, sides facing this way and the other two with them facing that way. So it sort of averages out and keeps it straight as a wing. Offer that up and just get an idea of where that length might need to be. 
I like it just a tad shorter than the abdomen. About there. Now that I know where that is, I can conceal that in my pinch grip, sit the feathers on top of the shank, come up and down with a simple pinch and loop. And I'll do that a few times without moving that pinch grip. And that means that they sit nicely on top of the shank. And that curve is, is looking quite nice to me. Last manoeuvre, just to snick that off. Make sure that you're still happy with that wing position. And then just create a caddisy looking head. And if you're a neat fruit like John, you'll make a nice smooth head. I don't particularly mind if there's a bit of cut ends of fibres showing through at the end of it, but each to their own. Coming with a whip finish. And again, four turns with this. It, it is up to you whether you then use some head varnish on that to finish off with. It is very robust. For this particular one, I'll treat myself to a little dab. But uh, being careful not to put so much on that it, it wicks into the CDC fibres. I'm not, I'm not even too mad if it doesn't go all the way around, to be honest. Because that, it's only going to go so far. But just for completeness. Wipe it down the sides like that. There we go. Very, very effective. Pulls fish up from almost anywhere. I've seen fish literally come over 10 feet across the stream to take that particular pattern. Um, great footprint, great profile, super effective, give it a try. <laughs>